who are prospering, people who are prospering at the expense of others. So I can't wait until I can get to that future kingdom because it sure isn't happening now. Well, the Bible certainly does speak of the kingdom of God as a future reality, as a place or perhaps a condition where everything is made right, where good people are rewarded, bad people get what's coming. That's true. It's not the whole truth, though. You see, Jesus emphasized the kingdom of God as a present reality. And it was not so much really a place or a realm, but rather it was the rule or the reign of God in the lives of those who were followers of Christ. It is a verb, much more than it's a noun. In Luke 17, all these religious leaders came to Jesus and they were asking him, like many did, when the kingdom of uh, heaven would come. But they were not at all interested in God's rule or his reign in their lives. They just wanted some inside information. But Jesus saw through all that, saw their unclean hearts, so he said these fascinating words to them in Luke chapter 17, verse 20. He said, the kingdom of God is not something that can be, or the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. Nor will people say, here it is, or there it is. Because the kingdom of God is in your midst. Which means, to put it simply, that the kingdom of God is here right now. We don't have to wait for it. We don't have to travel around for it. We don't have to get a secret decoder ring to understand it. It is closer to us than we are to ourselves. And it is completely available to us when we allow God to rule or reign in our lives today, right now. Jesus is saying here, we do not have to wait for some future kingdom. We can experience the kingdom of God, the rule of God, today in our life in our marriage, in our family, in our place of work, in our church, in our neighborhood. In the midst of a world that is kind of thumbed, its collective nose at this understanding of the kingdom of God, we can belong to a different people. ICCS can be one of those different groups of people who belong and are living in the reality of this kingdom of God. Whose hearts and minds and lives are being ruled by the powerful presence of the Spirit of God among us. The kingdom of God, the rule of God, can be a present reality, an actual experiential reality in our lives today. Which means, since the next life, eternity in heaven, is continuous with our life here on earth, that we can choose to be a part of God's eternal kingdom right now, today. We can choose to begin to order our lives around the teachings of Christ. We can learn to live under his good and gracious rule. And in so doing, we can learn to live fully in God's eternal kingdom right now, today. Which means that our lives have meaning. That what we do matters. That our lives matter. That this life matters. That this world matters. More on that in a moment. But now we have to ask a more difficult question. Um, how do our lives here on earth affect our experience in heaven. And here we're trying to explore this rather interesting concept of what heaven is like, what our experience after death will be like, uh, depending on who we are or perhaps how we have lived here. In other words, does our life, does how we live our lives here on this earth have an effect of our experience on the other side in heaven? And if our lives here matter, if they affect in some way our eternity, then it stands to reason that we should consider how we live now in this life today. So let me say two foundational things first uh, before I wade into this messy area by way of explanation. The first is that there's really very little in the Bible that teaches on this. There are a number of cryptic passages in the Bible, two of which we'll consider in a moment. But I want to emphasize that much of what I'm going to reflect on here, we'll reflect on together, is what we might call conjecture, kind of a maybe it's this way approach. And it must be stated with humility and a recognition that we are dealing with matters that are over our heads. Second, it has always been the teaching of the church down through the centuries, and therefore it is what we believe and hold onto vigorously at Oak Hills, and I know here at the Indian Christian Church of Sacramento, the ICCS that those who find themselves in eternity with God are there not because of our deserving, but because of what God has done for us in Christ. Our entrance into eternity with God can never be considered the result of our own worthiness. We are lost people who needed to be found. We are desperate people who needed to be rescued. We are sinners who need a Savior. 
and the birth, life, teaching, death, resurrection, ascension of Jesus, have, this has all saved us. And this is foundational to everything we're going to consider here. Having said all that, let's turn back to the latter part of the passage I read at the beginning of this message first, or 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. Apostle Paul says this, Therefore we are always confident to know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. But we make it our goal to please Him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. See the continuity there? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive what is due them for the good things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Here's a pretty clear and unambiguous teaching of Scripture that very clearly points out that after we die, every single one of us in this context is um, especially referring to followers of Christ. We'll have some kind of experience of being in the presence of Christ. And somehow the lives that we have lived will in some way cause us to, in the cryptic words that Paul uses here, Receive what is due us for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. There's another passage of Scripture that addresses this as well and is found in 1 Corinthians 3, uh, 10 through 15. The Apostle Paul says, By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wide builder, a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, or wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Now, I don't know about you, but these are troubling verses to me. They kind of bother me, and I kind of ignore them typically. But they seem to very clearly address the idea of what happens after we die and we enter into eternity. It seems, according to the scripture, that our lives on this earth matter that we are, as it were, building on a spiritual foundation. If we do this well, we are building something that is strong and precious, gold, silver, precious stones. If we do this poorly, we are building something weak, only temporal, kind of like what the three little pigs built to keep the, um, the big bad wolf away. Wood, hay, or, or, or straw. And on that day, and I assume sometime after we die, our readiness for life and eternity will be discovered or revealed. In all that which is tied to the values of this world that are contrary to God, all that junk that has been formed into our very character will be revealed. And it will need to go through some process, who knows what that is, of being removed or burnt out, as it were. And if we have prepared ourselves well, well, our good character and works will go before us and be a part of the very structure of eternity. But if not, if we have not prepared ourselves well, while we will still be eternally with God, we will, in what I find to be rather haunting words, suffer loss. Now there's much more we can say about this, but let me simply emphasize this. The Bible, I believe, is very clear in teaching that this life matters that the lives we live upon this earth matter. In fact, as I see scripture here, this life we live on this earth is a training ground to prepare us for life and eternity with God. And if we do not learn what we must learn on this earth, then there is a process by which we must learn this after we die. It may help us to think of heaven in this context as an acquired taste. And it is in this world in this life we live today, that we are developing this taste to hunger and thirst for righteousness, is how Jesus said it. Now, I obviously don't know, and neither does anybody else, even though they may say, uh, what this suffer loss idea means. But I do know that God invites us to learn how to prepare ourselves for heaven in this life. I believe this means that we are to so order our lives that the teachings of Christ 
and his way in this world are to form at the core of our being the way we live and work and love and relate to people. That we are gradually learning how to routinely and easily live as Jesus would live if he were living our lives. And this process, as Paul has talked about, is, uh, Pastor Paul Sunkari has talked about, is the, the process of spiritual formation. Spiritual formation into the image of Christ. There is no escaping this process, this spiritual formation. It is what must happen for anyone to inhabit eternity with God. We must develop a taste for it. We must learn how to live there well. And in order to do this, we will need to be healed, purged, as it were, from that which deforms us or keeps us tied to the ways of this world. I have no idea what that process will be like on the other side. I know I, know I don't like the words, suffering loss and escaping as though by flames, but it makes sense to me. If heaven and eternity is as wonderful as we all believe it must be, and as scripture teaches us, then we must become a certain kind of person who will be able to live there well. And to come to the end of our lives and to be prepared for death and life in eternity starts by deciding in this life that we have now to begin to order our lives around that kind of existence. And we will realize that this life we live matters. That what we do here matters. That our lives lived for God and, and His ways will be part of the very spiritual structure of eternity. It is often said that when we die, we can take nothing with us. It's not entirely true. What we bring with us into eternity is the person we have become here on earth. This spiritual formation does not grant us access into heaven. This is done through the grace of God and the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. But we do bring with us the spiritual formation that we have pursued in this life, which makes this life extremely important, that what we do here and who we become here matters. So let's finish up with one more thought about our lives mattering, and that is to learn how to live our lives ready. I've always found it interesting that whenever the Bible speaks about the second coming and the end of the world, it never encourages, almost always discourages, any attempts to figure out the time or the schedule, all those other details. In other words, the Bible doesn't teach about the second coming and the end of the world in order to give uh, you know, wild-eyed prophecy nerds some inside scoop on uh, the end times, and Armageddon and all that. Rather, the vast majority of passages that speak about the second coming of Christ, uh, the teaching about what our response is supposed to be is very clear. And here it is. In light of the very sure fact that Jesus is coming back to make all things right, to redeem this world, to make a new heaven and a new earth, in light of all that, be ready. Be ready. Be prepared. Don't get caught by surprise. In referring to the second coming, Paul used the metaphor of a thief in the night and being caught napping. Peter uses the metaphor of the thief in the night as well. He talks about how in light of the sure return of Christ, we should be pursuing lives of holiness, godliness. And Jesus in Luke 12, moving away from the second coming theme here, and instead talking about the end of a person's life, he's telling the parable about a rich man who was just looking for ways to store more of his riches. And God says to him, you fool, 